guys, it's Julie Spencer, author of the Buxton Peak series. We are working our way through Buxton Peak the early years today. This is the prequel to my Buxton Peak trilogy. And I hope you're liking the videos so far. And if you do, I hope you'll give it a thumbs up and like it. And subscribe to my channel and share these videos on social media so that others can enjoy them as well. Okay. <clears throat> Buxton Peak, the early years. Chapter 7, Touring the World We get to fly first class? Ian was shocked when the stewardess took his boarding pass and raised her hand, indicating he should head off to his left. I've never flown on an airplane before. Andy's voice became animated as he bounced along behind Ian. I don't think any of us have. Gary looked at each seat row and number, trying to match up his boarding pass. Most people just take the train. Ian found his seat and waved Kai over. London to Paris is not that far, Jeremy said. Wait till we take you to America. We get to go to America? Gary's eyes grew large. Your album is in the top ten on the billboard charts in the States. Jeremy chuckled and shook his head. We're about to announce dates for a North American tour. The producers are working out the details as we speak. This is getting real. Ian's breathing increased and his heart raced. I knew we were popular in the UK and Europe, but America? Wow. I've never toured Europe before. Kai pushed his carry-on bag into the overhead compartment and shoved Ian's up there as well. We're going to be in a different city every other day. Ian scooted over to let Kai sit by the aisle. He bent down to look out the window at the tarmac below. Really? We're going to be able to do any sightseeing? Andy asked. He and Gary filed into the row opposite Kai and Ian. We're going there to work, Ian said. We'll try to fit in some stops at famous places, Jeremy said, patting Andy on the shoulder as he walked by to settle into the seat in front of them. Many other familiar faces filled the remaining seats, and Ian had the distinct impression he was surrounded by producers and sound crew and handlers. Buxton Peak had monopolized most of the plane. Do they know we're coming? Ian asked. I mean, will it be anything like what you see on the telly where screaming girls are waiting for the band at the airport and they get out of the building, they can't get out of the building without signing a million autographs? Maybe, Jeremy shrugged. We'll see. Aren't you supposed to know these things? You're our manager. I've never managed a band that has grown this big, Jeremy admitted. Are we going to have bodyguards and stuff? Andy's wide-eyed innocence made Ian chuckle. You already have bodyguards, Jeremy replied. We do? Gary turned from gazing out the window and furrowed his eyebrows. Yeah, who do you think those big guys are who follow us around? Ian asked with a grin. I guess I just thought they were producers and tour managers and stuff, Gary said. You're clueless, you know that? Kai said, shaking his head. Whatever. Gary turned back to the window. Let's send out a tweet, Ian whispered to Kai. See if we can get the fans in Paris to react before we get there. What should we say? Kai whispered back. He already had his phone out and pulled up his Twitter account. Something they would only know if they were already following us. Ian pulled open his account as well. Paris is the city of love, right? So maybe something about hearts? Kai was still whispering. Open your hearts, hashtag Paris. Ian spoke as he typed, be there in one hour, hashtag Buxton Peak. Sound good? He looked up at Kai, bit his lower lip, and then hit tweet, sending the message out into the Twitter sphere. I'll retweet yours. When Kai was done, he leaned across to Gary and Andy. Guys, open your Twitter accounts and retweet Andy's message, or excuse me, Ian's message. What are you kids up to? Jeremy turned in his seat. Nothing, Ian raised his eyebrows and batted his eyelashes. Just a little experiment, that's all. Experiment, huh? Jeremy faced forward, shaking his head and chuckling. It was obvious when Jeremy discovered the tweet because he stood up and pursed his lips at Ian. A gleam in his eyes smoke, spoke volumes. He's not mad. Phew, you're asking for trouble, you know that? Did you know you now have over 600,000 followers? No way! Ian refreshed his screen, staring at the phone in disbelief. Hey, 
I'm only at 249,501, Annie said. He glared over at Ian with a pout. That's not fair. Way to be exact, Gary said. I'm just over 300,000. 560, Kai mumbled. He winked at Andy. I'm gaining on you, mate. I'm still ahead. Ian wiggled his eyebrows up and down. You always will be, Kai said, patting Ian on the knee. Hey, Jeremy. Ian stood up to observe the people in the row in front of him. Do we have a Twitter account for the whole band? Of course, Jeremy said. Last I checked, you had just over 500,000 followers. Who handles that account? Ian furrowed his brow. I do. A professional-looking woman sat uh, sitting beside Jeremy turned in her seat to look up at Ian. And yes, I've already retweeted your tweet. That's so cool, Ian said. Before sitting down, almost as an afterthought, Ian thanked her and lowered himself into his seat. The flight attendants moved up and down the aisles, checking if seat belts were latched and compartments were in position. They also told the boys to turn off their phones so they were unprepared for the results of their experiment. No girls, no crowds, just a boring airport and a waiting shuttle to their hotel. Ian climbed into the shuttle and slid over in the seat. It was like a small touring bus. No limo? I was getting kind of used to traveling in style. I think you'll get on just fine. Kai slid across the seat, making room for Gary and Andy. They were true tourists, gaping out the window at the Paris skyline, craning their necks to see everything at once. It seemed the shuttle driver went out of his way to point out famous landmarks in near-perfect English as, they drove, as he drove the boys from the airport to the hotel. Can you take us to the Eiffel Tower? Ian leaned forward to ask the driver. Oui, monsieur. The driver changed lanes and headed south. First, you must see Arc de Triomphe. Everyone must see. The boys crowded toward the window as they careened around the circle, observing the famous iconic arch. Just as fast as they entered the circle, they were off again and barreling toward the tower. The driver pulled up in front of the Eiffel Tower and Andy had his hand on the door before Jeremy suddenly stopped him. Don't get out of the car, Jeremy warned. There they were, girls, hundreds of them, everywhere. And they had makeshift signs with hearts and sayings such as, I heart Buxton Peak and Kai has my heart and my heart beats for Gary and marry me Ian with a big heart drawn around it. Guess they saw our tweets, Ian said. I don't see my name on any of the signs, Andy pouted and pulled his eyebrows together. There's one, Kai pointed. I heart Andy. Okay, we'd better get you out of here before they swarm the bus and tear our hearts from our chests, Jeremy said. I like that girl's chest right there, Andy pointed to a girl with a very low-cut blouse. The guys waved to all the girls as the driver floored the gas pulled away from the curb and sped off in the direction of the hotel, the name of which was written on the side of the shuttle. The driver picked up his two-way radio and spoke hurried, English, hurried French to the person on the other side of the line. Ian had the impression they were ordering additional security for the hotel. A young rock band and swarms of teenage girls apparently didn't mix well. Guess we should have chosen the limo, Ian said. Just remember, you brought this on yourself, Jeremy tisked and shook his head. I know, Ian tried unsuccessfully to hide his grin. He mumbled low enough so Jeremy couldn't hear. Guess we're rock stars now. Kai lifted his hand for a quick fist bump. Let's rock, let's rock, Ian answered. Why don't you like to be called a boy band? The public relations director held her notebook on her lap and tapped her pencil. It was the morning before their first show of their first ever North American tour, and Buxton Peak was almost as well known in the States as they were in the UK. Jeremy knew there would be interviews everywhere they went, and the boys needed some coaching. He asked their PR director, Rebecca, to practice an interview. We write our own songs, play our own instruments, and we don't dance in choreographed numbers. Ian thought it should have been so obvious. But you have a fanatic following of girls, as boy bands do. We write songs girls like, Ian said. Stands to reason they would follow us. Yes, you created quite a firestorm on Twitter while traveling through Europe. 
That was fun. Without looking at one another, Kai and Ian reached over and bumped fists. That was creative. Rebecca nodded. You used a different theme for each city and the girls just ate it up. They showed up in droves with custom-made signs and coordinating color schemes. I think they had as much fun as you did. Four teenage guys being followed around Europe by a bunch of screaming girls, Andy said. Yeah, that was tough. Girls were everywhere, Kai said. They ran after our tour bus as if we were going to suddenly tell the driver, Stop! There are girls! Let them ride on the bus with us! It was definitely fun. Yeah, Kai probably would have liked that, Gary mumbled. Kai pushed Gary's shoulder, but the grin never left his face. See now, you guys can't say stuff like that, Rebecca said. It's completely inappropriate and offensive. We take the music seriously, though. Ian didn't like it when the guys went off on these tangents. He tried unsuccessfully to keep them out of trouble, but it was getting more difficult as they grew older. He knew they were sneaking alcohol in girls backstage, but as soon as the spotlights shone, the dry ice poured across the stage and the pyrotechnics started sparking in time with the music, it all came together. Ian didn't need alcohol or girls. Music was all the high he'd ever need. Tell us about your pre-show routines. Rebecca continued with her practice interview. We like to tour the venture when it's empty to get oriented to the space. Ian felt a peace when he was alone with the instruments. He also liked to feel the emptiness of the arena before the crowds arrived. It was as if he was connecting his music to whatever surroundings he would encounter that night. We also listen to music on our headphones, both our own music and the bands we like. Then there's Ian. He listens to Phantom of the Opera and hymns and Mozart. Gary loved to tease Ian about his classical music selections. They know me too well. Rather than getting offended, Ian's heart swelled with pride for the recognition from his mates, but also for his positive choices. If only I wrote more appropriate music for our albums, Ian pushed the thought away. They had almost finished recording their second CD, and tour dates were in the works for their next European tour. Too late now. That's what the girls want to hear anyway, he thought. We take a lot of photographs with different fans who come and go backstage, Kai said. One of our producers brings them to us and tells us their names, which we never remember beyond 30 seconds. I remember that one girl, Stacy. Andy tried to hide his grin by biting his lower lip. That's just because she stayed backstage a little longer than some of the others. Gary pursed his lips with a knowing gleam in his eyes. She was a very nice girl, Andy raised his eyebrows. Roy, where is she from? What's her last name? Did you ask her for a phone number afterward? Kai challenged Andy. Why would I want to do that? I'm never going to call her or see her again. She probably starts stalking you on Twitter, Gary said. She probably already does, Andy shrugged. Don't you want a little bit more in your relationship than a one-night stand? Ian asked. That wasn't a whole night, Andy mumbled under his breath. Yeah, we had to be on stage in like an hour, Kai laughed. Plus, I'm pretty sure they weren't standing most of the time they were together. You guys are disgusting, you know that? Ian shook his head. Oh, come on, Ian, Andy said. You can't say you've never wanted to take one of those pretty girls backstage for a little while. Lock the door to your dressing room. Ian wouldn't allow Andy to trap him into that conversation again. I will never lock the door to my dressing room, ever. Unless Kai asks him to, Gary said. He asks me to lock my door all the time. Kai wiggled his eyebrows up and down. He doesn't want his virgin eyes stained again. All right, I'm going to start singing hymns right now and make you all listen to them, Ian said. You can sing anything you want as long as you sing it in a sexy voice and make eye contact with all the girls in the front three or four rows. They're going to cry and beg to be in your arms. Andy wouldn't let up. And pass out and need mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, Kai said. I'll volunteer for that job, Andy said. I don't think they can handle a live interview, Rebecca turned to Jeremy. This is obnoxious. All right, all right, let's get back on track. Ian looked pointedly at Rebecca. What else would you like to know? Rebecca sighed and shook her head but kept going. What are some things that have changed since you became famous, she asked. We used to go hiking and jogging together, Ian said, but now they don't let us go out in public because it's not safe. 
Instead, we go to the workout room, whatever hotel we're staying. Or we do push-ups and sit-ups in our tour bus, Kai said. Ian's got to keep those abs looking fit and trim, Andy added. We all need to stay healthy, Ian forced his gaze on each of the guys in turn. Which do you prefer, hotels or motorhomes, the reporter asked. Luxury suites with every amenity, Kai raised his eyebrows. Or cramped motorhome trying to sleep in a bunk with accordion-style curtain enclosures as we travel down a dark highway. Let me think about it. They all laughed along with Kai. Ian decided to play devil's advocate. We're thankful for the opportunity to have a place to stretch out as we travel in a climate-controlled, air-suspended vehicle with leather seats, a kitchenette, and a fully functioning loo. We travel in style. There's also that back lounge where Kai brings all his friends, Gary said. This isn't going to work. Rebecca's eyes were wide and his, her lips pressed together in a flat line. He's joking, of course, Andy said. The only person allowed back there is Ian. I just like a quiet place to kick back with a guitar, Ian shrugged. Ian's always improvising, Kai said. That's how he writes the music. Don't you all write the music together? She shifted her notebook. Nah, it's pretty much all Ian, Kai explained. We're a team. Ian put one hand on Kai's shoulder and the other on Andy's and smiled across the circle at Gary. I'd be lost without my mates. I could never be without them. Never? He engulped and pushed the little thought to the back of his mind. Too many times lately, thoughts like those were popping up unannounced. Thoughts about his future. Thoughts about the choices he was making and the song lyrics he was writing. Thoughts about the inappropriate actions of his mates. Thoughts about the direction his life was heading. He kept pushing them away. All I want to do is make music. Let's rock. Okay, that is the end of Chapter 7 of Bucks and Peak, the Early Years. I hope if you're liking these videos that you will give them a thumbs up and that you will share them on social media and subscribe to my channel so that you can not miss all the future videos. And next time we will start into Chapter 8.